This is Charlotte Talks. I'm Mike Collins on the local news roundup. CMS releases their $2.3 billion budget, which includes bonuses and raises for teachers and staff. We go through some of the details along with ongoing struggles with teacher absences. Finding affordable housing continues to be a struggle, as noted by the just released report on homelessness and housing instability for the region. We share some of that. The rate of COVID infections continues to rise, though it appears to be cresting. Still, hospitalizations are at all time highs here and nurses are stretched thin and that's putting it nicely plus an area leader of one of the most successful charitable foundations in the country announces his retirement the hornets are on a tear and snow Eh, maybe on the way for the third weekend in a row we'll see let's see who's going to take us through all this oh i see who's here ann dawes helms is with us she's wfae's education reporter good morning ann good morning Nick Oxner is chief investigative reporter for WBTV and co-author of The Vote Collectors about the ninth district election fraud scandal. Well, good morning to you. Morning and happy birthday to Father Time himself. Thank you very much. <laughs> I'm, I'm older than time. Katie Peralta is with us. She is not older than time. She's the youngest person on the panel. She's a reporter for Axios. Charlotte, congratulations on your youth. Welcome. Oh, thank you. Nick is definitely <laughs> younger than I am, but I appreciate oh, that is he? sentiment. Is he really? <laughs> oh, oh, ah. well, then, well, then you need then you need to grow a beard so you can catch up with him. Mm, I'll and work on Eric, that. okay, Eric Spanberg is the indefatigable or indefatigable. I don't know how you say it. Managing editor of the uh, Charlotte <laughs> Business. Journal. Welcome back. Thank you. I'm not the youngest on the show. (laughs) Okay. So the Charlotte Mecklenburg School Board this week approved its $2.3 billion budget. And how does that figure compare to previous year's budgets? Well, the short answer is it's a lot of money. Um, It's uh, up 5.6% with just the kind of things that are continuous. But then you layer onto that a big chunk of money, uh, $472 million in federal COVID-19 aid. That doesn't fit tidily in. There are a lot of strings attached to it, and some of it can be spent after this fiscal year. But um, again, short answer is they've got a surprisingly large amount of money this year, but there's potentially a cliff coming because, of course, the federal COVID-19 aid will not last forever. The state has also given school districts a break because of the fluctuation in enrollment. Normally, if your enrollment goes down, so does your funding for teachers and things. They've said, you know, for the last two years, they've said we're going to hold harmless. So CMS is actually getting more teacher positions than it normally would, which they said is great, but we can't always fill them because of all of this whole supply, you know, the, the, the pipeline is dry, people are leaving at record rates. This is not just a CMS thing, it's nationwide. So um, some good news and a lot of uncertainty. Of course, enrollment is down, as you pointed out, so that might help the teacher shortage a teeny tiny bit. Uh, but the budget overall, you reported, is, a, is up 5.6%, even when you take out the $472 million of federal COVID money relief. And it includes pay raises and bonuses for teachers and staff. Didn't they just get pay raises or bonuses or both? They did. And this is a little bit confusing because this is not a brand new budget. This is not something that suddenly happens. This is the budget year that started July 1st. And of course, they've been spending the money and paying people and doing all these things. It's just, you can probably remember, Mike, when we used to say, remember that year when the General Assembly didn't approve a budget until October? Well, this year they went until November. Then all the details have to filter through the Department of Public Instruction and down to CMS. So this is kind of saying, okay, here's our final budget. So yes, there have been layers and layers of bonuses. The raises are not that big, you know, basically averaging about 2.5% for most people. For teachers, it would be at least 1.3%, but, you know, depending on where you are on the step scale, that's not a very big raise. So again, we have these, a lot of bonuses coming in from different directions, but those are going to go away presumably at some point too. What it really means is they got a 6% pay cut because inflation is up 7%. So if you get a 1.3% raise, you're still behind. Uh, and despite the raises, despite the COVID money, they were unable to hire the 40 additional school social workers and psychologists <clears throat> Excuse me, that the schools wanted to help to deal with students' emotional and, and mental needs. Uh, they'd asked for an additional $31 million from the county and got about $17 million dollars. 
given the year we just went through with the lockdown, with uh, the extremely bad performance on the part of students who were behind the eight ball in terms of studying online, many of them, the unrest in the community that has led to a lot of guns being brought into schools and the student stress on top of that, they kind of needed these 40 counselors and psychologists. Why wasn't this funded? Well, you know, and this is an annual dance between the county commissioners and the school board. And I suspect what the county commissioners would say is we gave you an increase in funding. You decided how to spend it. If you decided, and it seems like this happens every year that they pitch for more counselors and psychologists and social workers. And then they say, gosh, we couldn't do it. But, you know, after that, they pitched to their um, executive director for federal programs. And she said, well, you know, with this COVID-19 money, we actually added 55 counselors and social workers and psychologists, as well as some people to deal with behavior problems. We contracted support for school-based mental health, including some Spanish-speaking therapists that are serving some of those schools. So, you know, this is gonna be a really interesting election year, I think, because the school board is gonna be running the same year as the county commissioners. And so those dueling views of whether, you know, CMS is being shortchanged by the tight-fisted county commissioners or whether the commissioners are trying to rein in a school board that isn't doing the right thing, we may hear some of this bubbling up as this year progresses. Well, let's talk about that a little bit, uh, about doing the right thing. On the heels of the recent revelations about poor performance among minority students at CMS, the school board heard this week that CMS is also falling behind on its efforts to ensure that Black and Hispanic students take college-level classes in high school where they, where they are qualified. Why is that? Well, uh, again, this is not terribly new. This has been a push um, pre-COVID. They really launched a push to make sure that all schools were offering all these classes because that's kind of the first thing. Some of the schools where the majority of the population is Black and Hispanic did not have as many advanced level classes. And there were ways you could get them, but they're saying we've got we've to get these, we've got to push them. Um, COVID has set them back somewhat on that, but also they're saying it's not enough to just say the class is there. That for some families, if you know, if your parents were college educated, if you've always been pushed to go to college, you're going to seek those out. Other, you know, first generation people, both the students and the parents need to be informed that A, that these classes exist, B, that there's a benefit to taking them, even if you're not sure you're going to go off to a four-year college, and C, that if you think it's going to be too hard and you're worried that this will pull down your GPA, we're going to be there and we're going to offer that support. And of course, you have to be able to deliver on that support. CMS Superintendent uh, Ernest Winston told the board that Black and Hispanic students and families often lack, just what you're talking about, often lack the information about advanced options, as well as the confidence that they can pass those classes. And he says he's planning additional efforts to push those options. But then board member Lenora Ship, a former principal, pushed back. She wants some details. What kind of specifics are we doing? Have we got the tutoring in place? Do they have after school opportunities before school where they can really feel confident that they're gonna pass these courses successfully? It's not dropping their GPAs. To which uh, Winston replied, the system has pockets of success in providing the support and the needs to make it to, uh, consistent. If, if white kids are getting this information and they are, why aren't minorities who now make up the bulk of the students in the classrooms? Well, again, it goes back to what's offered in the schools. And again, our schools are, you know, you have some schools that are majority white and Asian. Asian kids are also doing quite well. Um, but again, that, those may be schools where the families are more affluent, where college going and being able to afford college is much more assumed. You have other schools where there are very few white or Asian students. And, um, and you've got counselors that, that just kind of came up that counselors ideally would be talking every student through this. And everybody acknowledged that at the, the level, the caseload that counselors are carrying and the amount that they're expected to do, that's not realistic. Their student advisor said, you know, I don't want to like diss my stat, my school, but I've never met my counselor. So, and he is Latino. Uh, so, so uh, did uh, Ernest Winston respond uh, to Lenora's ships uh, urging that there be a plan for this? Does he have a plan? Did he announce details of a plan? Well, he answered their questions and um, 
th this is part of an ongoing effort that they have had to improve the way that the school board governs, which is basically to not bog down in the details, not sit there and bombard Ernest Winston with, well, I think we ought to do this, or what about that? You know, I, I want to tell you how to do this. They're supposed to be asking these very high level policy questions and getting an answer from him that says, my strategy is this, you know, this is where we are going to throw all of our resources at, even if it means cutting back on something. This is, this is our strategy and this is our vision. Um, and the, the consultant said they did not get there in this meeting. Yes, the consultant is A.J. Crable. Uh, he's with the Council of the Great City Schools, and he's been working with the CMS board for months. And he made some observations at earlier meetings and that we played on the air about how dysfunctional this board can sometimes be. And this week he offered what he described as a, quote, uncharitable review of what he observed at this week's meeting. And he made this comment. What's particularly bad about that is you now, at this very moment in life, you all don't know what is the superintendent's vision for this and what changes in resource allocation is he contemplating? So did Winston offer after that comment any insight following that critique? Or was there any reaction of that critique from the board? Not really. And again, sort of the, the hard-nosed, you know, this is them failing and, and at least Dashu, he, he specifically said, you as the chair did not call the board back onto track when they got off of our strategy. And she said, yeah, I know, but it's hard because I don't want people to be mad at me. So if you think the board is a bunch of bozos, you're probably going to say this is more evidence. I think the more nuanced or charitable interpretation would be they have chosen to do this work in public and they knew it wasn't going to make them look good. They have said this before, we're going to air our worst numbers and we're going to keep coming back to them. And if they aren't getting better, we're going to keep highlighting this and we're going to do our work. And full disclosure, I'm on a church board that's trying to do similar things. We're really bad at it. I mean, I have literally said, I'm glad there's not a reporter like me covering this. So they are trying to get better, even at the risk of looking bad in the short term. Okay, so, well, that, that, that's, I have a question about that because they may go through this process and may look bad as a result and they've made a decision to make it that public and, and air their dirty laundry, but should they be airing the dirty laundry of the comments of the consultant that they've hired to tell them how to do their jobs better? Shouldn't that be done behind closed doors? That's an interesting question because, uh, you know, as we have seen, A.J. Craybill does not pull his punches. And he, no. I have specifically asked him, what do you think of Ernest Winston's ability to do this job? And he said, that's, I don't evaluate the staff. I'm working with the board, you know, I'm, but he has been very critical of how they interact with Ernest Winston and okay. said, you know, it shouldn't be about whether you like the guy. It should be about whether you, he can. And so I think that's a question that is legitimate and is out there in the community is, I think almost everybody thinks he's a good guy. Does he have a strategy? Does he have a plan? Can he execute it? That's a fair question to be airing. And I, and I think, again, whether it should be the consultant airing it, it probably is worth discussing. And I believe they are still working on his evaluation behind closed doors. And CMS continues to suffer from teacher absences. You've already alluded to that. They're going down, but substitutes still can't ca cover all of the classes without teachers. There were 542 teacher absences on Tuesday with 253 substitutes available. How many of, that, of those absences were due to COVID and related illnesses or other illnesses versus teachers losing the profession? And how much above normal is that number? And I have 20 seconds. Uh, not 100% clear whether how much that includes just classes that are actually vacant. That does suck up subs when you have somebody who's gone, whether it's a medical leave or a resignation. But they did say COVID is going down among staff, and that's helping. Okay, when we come back, we'll talk about the latest homelessness report and more. Support for Charlotte Talks comes from WFAE members and Charlotte Eye, Ear, Nose, and Throat Associates, offering online appointment scheduling for cataract evaluations, allergy, sinus problems, and facial plastic visits. Details at C-E-E-N-T-A dot com slash appointments. Hearing the latest news is now easier than ever. If you own a smart speaker, you can enjoy WFAE's programs and podcasts with a simple voice command. Just say, play WFAE and we will keep you company. Monday on this pro program, we'll keep you company with the talking about the entertainment business around the country, but particularly here in Charlotte, one of the most affected industries by the pandemic. Concerts, plays, ballets, even Broadway and local productions shut down for over a year. They are coming back slowly and kind of 
herky jerky. So how did they survive? How are they doing now? Local arts groups and, and more. We'll talk about that Monday at nine. Hi, I'm Joni Deutsch, and on the latest episode of the Amplifier podcast, we hear from Jim Brock, the Charlotte music veteran who's literally drummed up work with legends like Kathy Matea, Joan Baez, and the Eagles' Joe Walsh. What I get from playing is so fulfilling. It's such a spiritual thing for me. Listen to the Amplifier podcast on Spotify, NPR One, and WFAE.org slash Amplifier. It's Charlotte Talks and the Local News Roundup on 90.7 WFAE and 90.3 WFHE. I'm Mike Collins. We're here with Ann Doss Helms, who command, commandeered the first segment. But now we move on to other topics and we will allow some other folks in on the on the banter. Eric Spanberg from the Charlotte Business Journal, Nick Oxner from WBTV, Katie Peralta Soloff from Axios Charlotte. Mecklenburg County put together a coalition of nonprofit and local leaders to find a way to make homelessness and housing affordability a thing of the past in Charlotte. And this week, that coalition released its initial strategy report, which spelled out the problem and likely solutions. First, the problem. How many homeless people are there right now on the streets of Charlotte in 2022, Eric? Well, it's kind of interesting. The most recent count, which took place last year, was about 31, 3200. But this report was released on Wednesday, which is the day of the annual count called the point in time count uh, when uh, Charlotte was doing it or Mecklenburg County was leading the way. Uh, and this is something that's mandatory to qualify for federal uh, homelessness uh, funding. So every city county does this and that happened to be the day that the report was released. Um, <clears throat> basically what's interesting, uh, one of the things that's interesting, Mike, which I assume we're about to get into is this is looking at both homelessness and housing instability because you have so many people who are uh, cost burdened. They're spending, you know, 50% of their income on rent or mortgage and utilities, which is much higher than the 30% threshold that's recommended. And so this is an attempt to take a comprehensive approach at looking at all aspects of housing and homelessness and the support services that are needed to really make a dent in what is obviously an intractable problem just about everywhere. And County Manager Dina DiOrio told you guys at the uh, Charlotte Business Journal, this is probably, quote, the most comprehensive look at housing and homelessness. And she likes it because it looks at the root causes. Uh, are those root causes some of the things you just talked about, the fact that people simply can't afford to live here? Absolutely. And, you know, the, the county retreat started yesterday and county commissioners were hearing all of these statistics. And once again, we've talked about a lot of these uh, trends and, and a lot of this data on this show, uh, you know, one of the statistics was that housing prices, single family homes have, have gone up 22%, I think, uh, in, in the year of the first year of the pandemic, August to August, uh, talking about apartment rent. Uh, one of the statistics that I think really jumps out that was, uh, I think, done by UNC Charlotte's Urban Institute is that you had 45% of your rental units were $800 a month or less uh, in 2011, 2012, somewhere in there. And then six, seven years later, it's down to 22%. So every number you look at shows that. And the other thing that you see over and over again is the, is the disparity between uh, you, you know, white households and, and black and Hispanic households. They also looked at behavioral health uh, situations, physical health problems, barriers, uh, I guess, such as race and, and other things, child care needs. They looked at all of those all of those factors. D did they say whether certain ones of them had gotten worse or better or were rising or falling, or did they just say these are the numbers? It was mostly these are the numbers uh, and, and conveying the trends of those prices that I was talking about and, and the income. So this was the culmination of phase one of this com commission's work. How many phases will there be? <laughs> Uh, well, as far as this portion, there will be two phases. So this is the initial comprehensive report. Uh, they want this to go out into the world and, and people, uh, both experts and everyday residents, to offer their thoughts and suggestions. And then probably around late summer, they're going to come back with version two, which is the implementation plan. And what that means is they're going to spell out how much this is likely to cost, who would likely be accounted on to fund this and how quickly it could happen. It looks like probably 2026 is when this would really all get going if everything goes well. 
But Katie, let's look at what this is because they did make some recommendations or they had some, they gave some examples of solutions that they're recommending. Can you share some of those with us? Yes. So some of these um, have been discussed um, by, you know, grassroots organizations and leaders um, in the past, but um, essentially turning hotels and motels into low income housing, particularly for folks making 30 to 60 percent of the area's median income, in other words, the lowest uh, income earners in the area. Um, another proposed um, idea is, of course, expanding social programs, um, encouraging landlords to accept housing vouchers um, is a way to expand access for a lot of folks who otherwise cannot afford rent just on their own, who might be cost burdened. Um, Solutions like that, uh, you know, cr the creation of another um, organization or the branch of another organization to um, kind of call these plans together. Um, but I think it's it sounds like they want sort of a, a combination of solutions as opposed to one quick fix. This is a very comprehensive look at the problem, and uh, they certainly acknowledge that there are many root causes of this. There were a lot of people and a lot of organizations involved in this uh, commission. Uh, not all of these ideas or solutions sound new to me. Are they new? No, I mean we've we've heard these before too, right? Like, and and more specifically, we've we've heard examples of how they could come to life in the past. I mean, Heal Charlotte is in the middle of trying to to raise money to purchase um, a hotel up off, I think, Old Concord Road. Um, we've, we've heard about the, the preservation of, you know, certain apartment complexes throughout Charlotte to maintain rent at a certain level. Um, there are examples of these um, efforts going on all over Charlotte. And I think that the fact that they called it out specifically in this plan as, as you know, a surefire way to address um, affordability and homelessness in Charlotte is, you know, just speaks to how necessary it is right now. Sure. You know, one thing that really jumped out at me for, and I guess probably from having covered this was the affordable housing movement that began really in 2018. And you remember there was uh, the, the move to triple the amount of the city bonds, and then there was all this private money raised. So they had this statistic in there that uh, over $300 million has been generated between uh, companies, nonprofits, uh, the city bonds since 2018 for affordable housing. And basically it's a drop in the bucket. You know, the, the report even says, as wonderful as this is, uh, it's nowhere near enough. And so I, I think to Katie's point, a lot of this has been going on. And what this report really says is we have to do a lot more because this is not really making a meaningful change in these trends. They are the Which is, that's yeah. something that Charlotte city leaders have been saying for years now. And we keep seeing more reports like this. So the real question will be, do we actually have the political will, the business capital, and the ability to actually execute on any of these recommendations. And uh, we'll see. Because in the same week that they released this vision uh, statement, uh, the, uh, which calls the Charlotte Mecklenburg Housing and Homelessness Strategy Group calls for making homelessness rare, brief, and non-recurring by giving every person the ability to access permanent affordable housing. At the same time, they said, uh, this is all this money that we've put toward this right now is a drop in the bucket. The Charlotte Housing Trust Fund, which has been the Charlotte's largest investment to address this issue over the last 20 years, say they can't keep up with the need and that the $50 million bonds that we keep passing simply aren't enough. So in the next section of this, the next uh, uh, phase of this, Eric, you said they'll, they'll recommend how much this might cost. Will they also be recommending how to fund it? Yeah, and I think that's going to be the really interesting part to watch because uh, you're hearing a couple of things. You're hearing that this still falls mostly on the public sector. Remember that the city deals mostly with affordable housing. The county deals mostly with homelessness, although there is crossover. But, you know, that's kind of historically where they've lined up. Uh, but you're also hearing that there needs to be a lot of private money put into this. And so the question becomes, what is that willingness in the private sector? They're obviously participating in this study and the reports and a lot of the other ones that have been done. Uh, I, I think the other thing that's kind of interesting to watch is how does all this get coordinated? Because uh, Nick and Katie just referred to, I mean, we 
my head is spinning and I'm supposed to cover these things, right? I mean, I, it seems like every two weeks, there's a new report, there's a new commission. Uh, you have uh, leading on opportunity going way back to 2014 uh, with Charlotte being ranked 50th out of 50 for mobility. So I think if one of the, the miraculous feats that they could accomplish is if they can sort of get all these things together so that everybody knows where they're going. Yeah, because it would seem to me if we're confused about who's going to do what, if you're in need of these services, you're, you're absolutely clueless. You couldn't f possibly follow the bouncing ball here. And that, that is pointed out in this report pretty clearly. That is one of the, the goals of this is to make it much easier to access uh, sort of one-stop shopping or two-stop shopping of, okay, right. I have this problem with housing. Well, what do I do? Where do I go? And, and that's the other thing, Katie. You mentioned the fact that they, they, one of the recommendations might be coming up with another yet another organization to deal with this. It seems to me the best policy would be to distill what we already have. Yeah, well, it, it, okay, I, I'll, I'll refrain from saying what I was gonna say, but I, you know, some of the things ongoing um, are, are happening on the policy level too, right? Like improving transit options. Um, the, the ones, the, the transit tax that had been widely discussed as part of the, you know, major transit uh, overhaul this year might not even happen in 2022. Um, certain council members like Julie Eisold have been beating this drum for years that um, one lower hanging fruit that doesn't cost, you know, $13 billion is just improving the bus system. Um, you could do that. I remember Steve Harrison reported this week for WFAE. But we've, been, um, we've been, hold it, we've been improving the bus system since I've been here and I arrived here in 1983. Uh huh. Yeah, yeah. That's a good use of air quotes for all our viewers who are not streaming this live. But <laughs> um, I mean, the 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 wait times for the bus system are still ridiculously long. Even chopping those down to fifteen minutes, it seems like a major feat right now. And 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 that is one way to improve access for people. That's one way to get people, you know, affordably from A to B. People spend a huge chunk of their money on transit. Um, all of these recommendations do not necessarily have to be rooted in building more housing. Um, that's a big part of the solution. But I think that the big takeaway here is like, this is a comprehensive problem. People spend tons of their income on housing, but also on other, other facets of life that, that the city has, or the city and county have control over, like, you know, life transit, you know, daycare is a significant cost for people. Sorry, Nick, I cut you off there. Okay, Nick, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, not only is, just take the transit thing, for instance, not only is transit long wait times, it's inconsistent. And that's almost the bigger problem. And again, shows, oh, but we're spending all this money on this for an inconsistent result. We've built a gold line, but no one can rely. It's so unreliable. The city's not charging anyone to use it. And so what good is investing these tens of millions or hundreds of millions of dollars if it's not actually serving literally anybody? on a regular and reliable basis. And there's one other thing, Mike, that I want to mention, which is, and this was talked about a little bit at the county retreat this week, which is the, the nature of market forces, which is while Charlotte feels and is much more expensive to us than it was five or 10 years ago, comparatively to many other places, it's not that expensive. And so when you have people moving in, we have a lot of young professionals moving in. We are a millennial city, as, as a demographer described us yesterday. Uh, you know, then it's much easier to pay $1,500 a month for rent. And so that then puts more downward pressure on people who are struggling. And then you throw in one other factor, which was mentioned this week, which is the idea of corporate buying of single family homes, which then uh, increases those prices. So you have all kinds of different Different factors, some of which can be controlled or nudged, and some of which really can't. Talk, Nick, a little bit more about people who are struggling because Ramp CLT, which is a program that's been distributing millions of dollars in rent and utility and mortgage assistance from the federal government during the pandemic, has stopped accepting new applications. Why? Well, they're out of money. And this is, again, a perfect example. Look, we have this great program, the city says. That's whole goal, Mike is to take federal dollars combined with county dollars to help people stay in their homes during the pandemic. That is the whole point of the program. And then we told people, if you need help making your rent because you're out of work, because of COVID, because of whatever, apply. We can pay for three months of your rent. We can keep you in your home. We can keep you from being housing unstable or homeless. And what happened? People turned in November and December and, and January 2 of this year, 
uh, to try to get that assistance that they've been told to ask for and suddenly learned that the program is out of money. Got about 13 or so million dollars left that, that they projected. Did they run out of money because the demand was so high or because there wasn't enough to begin with? Well, that's a good question, Mike. There's also a question about the oversight and administration of these funds. It's important to note that I think it's 15, it might be 14 uh, counties in North Carolina are administering their own housing programs. Uh, the rest of the state is using the North Carolina HOPE program uh, to keep people in their homes, to pay their electricity and utility bills as well as pass through rent. Um, and we know, we've seen in the HOPE program, not the rent program, we've seen in the HOPE program, widespread evidence of fraud that is not being caught. And so um, they bottom line is though, Mike, they've run out of money. They say they might, county manager Dina Diorio says she wants to get more, but they just put up a note on their website as people thought they had this as a resource to turn to. They said, nope, we're out of money. And all these people that are struggling have no nowhere to go. Well, let me, ask, to, the, go let ahead, me, let me ask the question in a different way. And that is, I, I asked you about money. Uh, did, was the demand too high versus the amount they got? How much did they get and how much did they distribute? They had distributed, I think I, I saw something like 51 million to 11,000 households, something uh, in that realm. But what I was going to mention, I, I guess related to that, Mike, is, uh, and Nick, is, you know, um, what that report, the report we've been talking about stresses is having the resources readily available to prevent or quickly fix these problems. Well, when you look at this, as you just went through, this is federal COVID relief money. You know, this is not money that we typically have. So if that's running out that quickly, you're going to have to have quite a treasure chest to really live up to that brief, uh, rare and non-recurring homelessness and housing instability. So that's why I go back to what is the price tag that they put on this when it comes out in the summer? Ramp. CLT or Ramp Charlotte, are they a, a governmental organization? Are they non-governmental? Are they non, not for profit? Who, what are they? So this is a program that's using county and federal funds, I think overseen by the county, but being administered by a private contractor. And Mike, and just to why, put- uh, And why is that? Why do we have all these private contractors? Because you mentioned fraud, and this is happening all over the country where there's the money pours in but very little goes out, it seems to me, and, there, and the need remains to be pretty high. And there seems to be very little accountability for this money. Why? There's very little accountability for anyone in government, Mike. That's the trend. Um, but you raise a very good question of who actually is getting this money. You know, uh, just to go back and put a finer point on the question you asked earlier, it's 11,000 households with $51 million in rental and mortgage assistance. That's what RAMP CLT says. Um, but it's also somewhat difficult to check that in real time. The way that this set has been set up with these programs by the federal government is you spend all the money, then you do an audit after the fact, and you find out whether or not you used the money appropriately. And if you didn't, the government agency might be on the hook for paying it back, which has grave consequences so for later. So very quickly, they, th they said they might get back into the business of helping people if they get some more sources of funding from the city or the county in 10 seconds or less. Is that likely to happen? Meh. <laughs> okay, that's good. That's quick. Again, much better if you're streaming and you can see his gestures. <laughs> that's right. We're coming right back <laughs> in a second. <laughs> Support for Charlotte Talks comes from WFAE members and Mazda of South Charlotte pledging to help end child hunger in the Carolinas through ongoing support of Second Harvest Food Bank of Metrolina. Details about this initiative at MazdaofSouthCharlotte.com. Supreme Court Justice Stephen Breyer announced his plans to retire. Now President Biden has the chance to make his first nomination, indicating he will select a black woman as his pick to send to the Senate for confirmation. Omicron-fueled COVID infections have dropped in the Northeast, but are now surging in the Midwest. The trial of the three officers involved in the murder of George Floyd begins this week. Prosecutors must prove they had a responsibility to intervene as Derek Chauvin killed Floyd. Those are just some of the stories they'll be talking about as the roundup of the week's news continues with the national focus on 1A in 20 minutes at 10 o'clock. And we'll continue our local look in a mere 30 seconds. Stay with us. 
Roughly 40,000 students in Charlotte Mecklenburg schools identify as Hispanic. Some Latino parents say advocating for their children is not always easy. I asked for someone who speaks Spanish, and there isn't anyone, so they speak to me in English, and I don't understand. Join us as we talk to parents, teachers, and activists in our three-part series, Breaking Barriers, Challenges, and Opportunities for Latino Students, Tuesday on 90.7 WFAE and WFAE.org. It's the Local News Roundup on Charlotte Talks on Listener Funded, WFAE and WFHE. I'm Mike Collins. We're here with Katie Peralta Sola from Axios Charlotte, Nick Oxner from WBTV, and Doss Helms is here from WFAE News, where she is our education reporter, and Eric Spanberg from the Charlotte Business Journal. COVID cases are in flux. Thanks to the Omicron variant, but we are starting to see peak, uh, peaks around the country in terms of cases and hospitalizations. And this week, Novant Health told us that as of uh, 10 to 12 days ago, the county reached its hospitalizations peak with numbers beginning to slowly decline. Overall, hospitals are at 95% capacity here. And here's what Novant Health's Dr. Sidney Fletcher told WSOC-TV. We've seen a very sort of slow drop over that period of time. And I think our models show that over the next one to two weeks, we expect a pretty precipitous decline, which is really, really great news. Um, I would say that uh, the, the testing demand uh, has gone down uh, quite a bit. And county health leaders say the drop in testing demand is the result of three things. At-home tests are being used, they are easier to acquire, and test sites are now widespread throughout the county. County Health Director Raynard Washington has an additional take. I think we're seeing some of the impact of a lot of people have gotten COVID and we're starting to have this trail off. And so the need is naturally going to, to start to taper off. So Novant Health's Dr. Sidney Fletcher says home testing kits are easier to acquire and the federal government is making these kits available. But tomorrow, because of the difficulties, this is another example of mixed messages. Uh, evidently, there's difficulty in getting these tests. Uh, and so as a result, Mecklenburg County residents with symptoms of COVID-19 who are unable to access any of the 26 free testing sites or by at-home testing kits can get them free from Mecklenburg County Public Health tomorrow, Saturday. How's this going to work and where do you have to go to get them? I've stumped the panel. Yep. Well, there no, they, I mean, there, there are two sites. One of them is in Huntersville. The other one is, I think, the CPCC Harris campus. Uh, this has been done uh, at least one or two times before, Mike. So uh, I think uh, basically they do it for three, four hours as long as supplies last and, and, and they distribute them. So this is not, um, th this is a continuation, not a new wrinkle, so to speak. The, the federal government evidently uh, is making home testing kits available for no charge. They'll mail them to you. I think they're also make, making masks available. And of course, they're now saying that cloth masks are not sufficient against the Omicron variant. You need those N95 masks or the next step down uh, masks. And they're making those free as well. How do you get them? The masks are being uh, distributed, I believe, at, at Walgreens and, and other sort of public places. So that is one way. And then, uh, of course, they're, they're for sale. What I think one of the problems, or I know one of the problems they were having is when Omicron really uh, ramped up in December and early January, of course, everyone went out and bought all the masks. So now they're starting to get some more uh, of those in. And so they're more widely available. The, the call the other day with uh, Dr. Washington and Atrium and Novant was, was mo mostly optimistic that uh, the availability is improving and that that combined with the trends of uh, slow decline will sort of sort this out here in, in the next few weeks. Uh, StarMed CEO, Mike, Dr. Mike Estramonte told WSOC-TV in the past 30 days, StarMed performed more than 130,000 COVID tests, but the demand is now dropping and he hopes we're turning a corner. If we're on the other side of this now, hopefully uh, we don't have another variant that comes along um, and we can get back to some normalcy. But wait, not so fast. Slow down there, buckaroo. Another <laughs> variant is coming along. It's an Omicron sub-variant called BA.2 or 
point to, or what, however you say it in the digital age, its, it's properties are, are still being investigated. In Denmark, they're testing the vaccines against this variant, which has already appeared in both South and North Carolina and here in Mecklenburg County. I think they're reporting, what, two cases in Mecklenburg. Do we know how easily, easily it transmits, what its impact on the body is? how the vaccines handle it so far? Do we have any clue at all about this new variant? I think much of that is unanswered. What, what kind of caught my attention the other day is Dr. Washington was uh, maybe not dismissive, but he, he did not seem very worried about it. He just said, this is, you know, th this is not a problem. We're, we're not fixated on it. Uh, and, you know, of course, we will keep an eye on it, but it, it, it does not look like an overwhelming problem. So uh, at, at risk of uh, eating my words within 48 hours, that's what I know. <laughs> Now, Katie, Novant announced, I think yesterday, that they were going to give, front, I guess, their frontline employees a week off or some kind of extra pay award because of how hard they've all been working for these past two years. And we've known for years that hospitals ha have been having difficulty in finding nurses because not enough people are choosing to go into the profession. And now you have these people who are exhausted from treating this tsunami of COVID cases and younger nurses are leaving the job, making things even worse. Uh, what's the situation specifically in our area? So in our area, it's interesting because at least um, at uh, UNC Charlotte, applications are actually up for the nursing program. So they're not having necessarily a problem with the incoming pipeline of nurses, at least at this one particular institution. Um, but one of the big problems right now is nurses leaving um, hospital jobs for travel nursing positions, which pay gobs more money. Um, and you have oftentimes uh, eat, like, you know, flexible schedules. You have a certain amount of time that you'll work at a certain location. Sometimes you can get placed at the hospital you used to work at, but, work, but make three times as much as you used to. Um, another problem is, as you mentioned, people are burned out. People are just leaving the profession because uh, they feel that they're not being compensated adequately to stay in a job that puts them at risk and that has compromised their physical and emotional health. Um, nurses are retiring. There's a backlog of international nurses um, that have not been approved to come back to the United States. I believe Philippines is one of the large countries that we get nurses from here. Um, so it's a whole combination of really complicated factors that are compounding the situation that um, it, it you know could could potentially put patients' well-being at risk. And that's what I've heard from nurses I've spoken with and with um, experts in the field that I've spoken with. And it's not something that's necessarily talked about that much uh, among people who are not in nursing. Um, these days, I mean, you know, throughout the pandemic, it's all about, you know, banging pots and pans for healthcare workers and, and cheering them on and all of that. But there's not that much going on. There's not as much of that going on these days. Um, and at the end of the day, Yes, you know, being in the medical field is, is a, you know, honorable, wonderful thing, but this is a job too. Um, it's, it, we're not talking about the priesthood here. This is a job and people need to be able to have lives outside their jobs and they need to be able to support themselves. And I think right now it's just a really, really stressful industry to be in. Yeah, and if, you, if you've gone through two years of it, dealing with people who are intensely suffering and dying in record numbers, that takes a toll on your mental health. And no matter how much you love the job of nursing, but because you want to help people when you can't help them because they haven't gotten the vaccine and they're dying in record numbers, it's like... Uh, why am I doing this? So I, I get that. Um, meanwhile, the state is now, Nick, calling for greater transparency in hospital billing following a WBTV investigation. They've released a report or, yeah, that found more that, that found that some nonprofit hospitals have billed millions of dollars to poor patients who should have qualified for free or discounted charity care. And you uncovered this. How did this happen? No, my colleague David Hodges uncovered this to be clear. Um, his story on Monday found more than 100 patients who had to go to Atrium Health uh, for emergency medical treatment uh, who could not afford to pay their bills in full or on time and have been taken to court by Atrium. And that was just last year. Um, some of whom it's not even clear that, that they knew that they were being taken to court based on the court records that David reviewed. Uh, but the bottom line is you have people who need emergency medical treatment who ultimately can't pay for it. And that's where these nonprofit hospitals 
uh, State Treasurer Del Falwell argues, uh, should be giving what's called charity care and writing off the money that they can't pay. And WBTV's David Hodge just spoke to one couple who are currently being sued by Atrium Health for medical bills that they accrued in less than 24 hours at the hospital. Here's Mary Oliver. A police officer came to the door to deliver the papers. And when I opened it up, <laughs> we could not believe it. A bill for $29,000. That's more than $1,000 an hour. So uh, what's their story, Nick? Yeah, the story is that Mary Oliver's husband had a burning and tingling sensation in his hand. So he went to Atrium ER. He was there for less than 24 hours, but they wanted to hold him to do some tests, I think an MRI. And yeah, they had this bill for almost $30,000. It got reduced down some, but they still were on the hook for about 14 grand. And they said, look, we knew that we were going to have to pay something. They don't have insurance, but they didn't think it'd be that much and they can't pay all of that. So again, this is where nonprofit hospitals, which Atrium is and most hospitals in our state are, uh, nonprofit hospitals are expected to just write off the cost of that care or take you know, a very small fraction of what someone can pay. Uh, and instead, in this case, like the Olivers, who needed this emergency medical treatment but couldn't afford it, uh, ultimately, they came to find out they didn't think it'd be so expensive, uh, and so they ended up in court. So according to The Observer, Atrium Health uh, information is not included in this statewide study of nonprofit hospitals because Atrium Health operates as a public entity known as a hospital authority, and hospital authorities are not required to be as transparent. This is the largest hospital system in the area. Why should they be exempt from being transparent for God's sake? Well, they are subject to the North Carolina Public Records Act. Uh, it's worth noting that Atrium says they give much, they were um, included in a previous report from the, from the state treasurer's office that found they were not writing off as much charity care as they could. Atrium on the other hand, contends that they are actually writing off much more charity care, uh, billions of dollars uh, by their math and their metrics. They actually contend they are writing off lots and lots of charity care and that this notion that they aren't simply is not true. Um, but uh, this was the, the press conference and unveiling this new report on Wednesday from the treasurer was a unique thing, Mike. You had a Republican treasurer and then you had Republican and Democrat lawmakers from both the state house and the state senate all at one press conference agreeing with each other that this is a problem that needs to be looked at. And at that press conference, the state treasurer, Dale Falwell, uh, referred to your story and, and to the Olivers. They don't know who these legislators are or that I'm the treasurer. And that's not what's important today. What's important is that we know who they are and the plight that they're going through. So what's been the response of North Carolina hospitals and those in our area to the findings of that state study? So the, largely speaking, the hospital's position is that they are writing off a lot of charity care, more charity care. This is the second academic study that the treasurer has commissioned that has found large, the same type of result that hospitals aren't writing off all the charity care that they could. Um, and, but the hospitals are saying they are doing everything they can and that these, I, I'm you know generalizing here, but generally speaking that uh, they are doing everything they can and these studies just aren't accurate. He's also doing the state treasurer, Dale Falwell, is also doing his own personal investigation of this by purposefully not paying his medical bills to see what people who can't pay their medical bills are enduring. What's he has he did he talk about what he's discovered so far? He's a convoluted system in which he's actually tried to pay some of his medical bill, but he can't. He can't, you recall, he had a really serious bout of COVID right at the very beginning of the pandemic. He was hospitalized for quite some time. And, and, and what he has found is this system where even when he wants to pay portions of it, he can't, or uh, he's not sure that the hospital is going to accept his payment. And uh, it, again, another step to see, uh, to see what this is like. So we're in the lightning round now, and we want to talk about uh, how at the end of last year, uh, we lost several uh, key government leaders, and now we are about to lose uh, the leader of a key philanthropic foundation, one of the most successful in the country, I think the sixth largest community foundation, Foundation for the Carolinas. 
their CEO, Michael Marsicano, announced this week that he is retiring. In his time there, he grew their assets from $245 million to nearly $4 billion. Very quickly, for those who don't know, what is Foundation for the Carolinas? What work do they do here? How have they impacted the area? Foundation for the Carolinas manages uh, other people's money, uh, and those people ask them to direct it to various uh, civic efforts or charitable groups. And uh, my, Michael Marsicano had started at the Arts and Science Council, very good at raising money uh, and figuring out how to get money into the philanthropic world. And so that's exactly what he's done, as you said, building this foundation from really a kind of afterthought to the foremost philanthropic group in this region. And kind of okay. a community convener as well. I think they, they don't just hand out money, they pull people together to work on big issues like the opportunity gaps and, and reading and situations like that. Project Lift that's, was a- And that has been under Michael, yes. and that's been under Michael Marsicano's yes. leadership. Before yes. we go, we must talk about the Hornets, the hottest they've ever been, I think. <laughs> I'm leaning on Eric for this because he knows all things Hornets. It's been kind of a roller coaster ride in the last week or so, but they had a big win on Wednesday over the Indiana Pacers, 158 to 126 with another triple double for LaMelo Ball. What's the meaning of all this? 158 I, points. That's a, that's a team high, isn't it? That, that is a franchise record. And Mike, I know that you love the triple double, which of course is double figures in points, rebounds, and assists. You also know, and you, you talked my head off about this uh, yesterday about how LaMelo joins LeBron James, uh, Luka Doncic and Magic Johnson as the only players to record five triple doubles before the age of 21. So I want to thank you for conveying that information to me. Thank you so much. <laughs> and let us leave you with one word, snow. That's our weather. <laughs> if we get it, it'll happen overnight, beginning at about 11 o'clock tonight. And we're going to get a tiny, tiny amount, they say. They're revising those numbers down. Other parts of the state will get more. And Doss Helms, our education reporter for WFAE News, Nick Oxner from WBTV, Katie Peralta Soloff from Axios Charlotte, and Eric Spanberg from the Charlotte Business Journal. Thank you all for the hour. Charlotte Talks with Mike Collins is a production of 90.7 WFAE. Support for Charlotte Talks comes from Mazda of South Charlotte. Our executive producer is Wendy Herkey. The senior producer is Aaron Kiever. Our producer